So before we start this video, I would like to make something abundantly clear. This is in no way, shape or form financial advice. You should not buy, sell, trade, invest or do anything based off of the information you get from this video. I am a journalist, not a financial advisor or someone who can tell you what to do with your money. Now, that being said, my name is Joseph and this is AJC in context. So this video will be broken up into two parts. The first part will be me explaining what Bitcoin actually is. And the next part will be an interview to help us wrap our minds around what the real world implications of Bitcoin are and how the world is going to react to it. In order to understand what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are, I spoke to Professor Richard DeMillo, chair of Georgia Tech School of Cybersecurity. And from that conversation, I think it's important we look at the issues they're trying to solve first. This will be a brief history. When you buy something, unless you're using cash, there is a third party involved. Whether that be a bank, credit union, or credit card company, they are involved in the transaction. And while all these different institutions are taking a cut of the sale, they also provide a service. They let sellers know you actually have the money for the purchase and you can prove you paid. But there are some people who wanted a more anonymous and peer-to-peer -peer way to pay for things. So in 2008, an anonymous coder or coders going by the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto, whose mere existence is still highly debated, created Bitcoin and was the first to use blockchain technology. Once this digital currency was created, the next step was to solve the issues we talked about earlier in the video. And that is where blockchain comes in. To explain blockchain, Professor DeMillo said, the idea is most cryptocurrencies rest on the idea that you could have a universal ledger that exists off in cyberspace somewhere that contains all transactions ever made by that currency and is not controlled by any government. Rather than having one institution having access to the records of transaction, blockchain is essentially a ledger everyone in the world has access to. No government, no bank, and no group of people owns it. Every purchase anyone has ever made with Bitcoin is constantly updated in the ledger everyone else is watching. Professor DeMillo said, quote, it is not an exaggeration to say this is a trillion dollar industry. Anonymity is a big part of it too. You don't need an ID to buy, store, sell, or trade any cryptocurrency, Bitcoin included, which gives it a certain level of anonymity some users like. DeMillo says, quote, blockchain is not more secure. In fact, it repeatedly gets hacked. There is nothing inherently more secure about blockchain. There is some danger to this. Bitcoin has no intrinsic value and it's not backed by any nation. If enough people woke up one morning and decided not to use Bitcoin, the value would freefall. West, thank you so much for joining me. Happy to be here. So today we're gonna to talk about Bitcoin and some of the regulations around it or what they could be. So I guess the first question is what relationship, if any, do you see between the US dollar and cryptocurrency? Well, um, couple, you know, couple, couple points. Um, uh, first of all, you know, the, the, uh, the U.S. dollar uh, plays uh, a, a critical role in the world economy. So, you know, the U.S. dollar is the de facto world currency as it stands now. Um, and this has been the case since, you know, the Bretton Woods Conference um, uh, shortly after World War II. So, um, uh it, it affords America an enormous amount of influence around the world. So when you see, you know, it puts us in a unique position. So when you see sanctions <clears throat> happening, um, you know, we, we can use our U.S. dollar leverage on other countries um, to adhere to, the, to various sanctions and so forth, because, you know, technically, if, if you're uh, in Europe or Latin America and you want to buy oil, for example, from Saudi Arabia, ultimately you have to execute those transactions in U.S. dollars. The government, uh, and really governments across the world, but the U.S. government has been struggling even to identify what Bitcoin is. Is Bitcoin a currency? Is Bitcoin a security? Is Bitcoin an asset? Now, I think they've settled, you know, that it's not 
you know, necessarily a, a security. Um, but, but an asset, yep, you know, currency, yep, you know, still trying to work that out. So, you know, that, that's, you know, the first challenge um, around, around Bitcoin. Um, so the, you know, the, the relationship of Bitcoin to the dollar, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, it, it, Bitcoin has a relationship against all, you know, fiat currencies. Uh, and its relationship to the dollar is that, you know, it can be converted into dollars, much like gold or right. silver can be converted into dollars. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you know, think of it as, I don't know, this is a terrible analogy, but like digital gold. Is it realistic to think that the U.S. will also create its own digital currency and kind of utilize some of the blockchain technologies that are being used in like Bitcoin and Ethereum yeah. and NFTs and that stuff? So, yeah. So, you know, one of the things that excites some folks about uh, the digitization of, of um, you know, the, you know, the US dollar and so forth, um, you know, in theory, you know, uh, it, it could be good for those that are disconnected from, currently disconnected from the digital economy. Now, real world applications, I mean, you know, we have 50 million people in America underbanked unbanked or underserved that you know rely very heavily on prepaid cards mm. you know and what's what is a prepaid card it's cash you know converted into digital through a card you know that is challenging enough you know you know ex expecting that you know that same exact population to embrace uh, a 21st century, you know, digital money scheme. You know, I don't know, you know, eventually, yeah, you know, but here, here's the context. The context is this. So for the last 10, 15 years, the world's been moving from a cash economy to a digital economy. Okay. Right. And as we shift, there's going to be a ton of people left behind. Mm -hmm. So those people will not, those people without phones and laptops, you know, um, are going to be in trouble. So, you know, I mean, that's, so there's a big focus on getting those folks plugged in, you know, to, to the ecosystem just as it stands now, which is, you know, credit cards, debit cards, prepaid cards, gift cards, you know, that that's, you know, or, you know, uh, money transfer systems, um, you know, and so forth. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really big deal. The technology is moving quicker. How you pay, you know, is is quicker. There are real time payments, faster payments, um, and it, it's just you know, and the speed of innovation is just turning the world upside down. And government regulators have a hard time keeping up with technology just in general, right? But the accelerated speed at which payment technology is is evolving is way beyond you know the the norm of how a lot of technology evolves across other industries mm -hmm. in a pandemic the pandemic has accelerated it even further right mm -hmm. uh, contactless payments and and you know so so it's uh you know the government realizes that you know that you know this stuff's happening. They got to deal with it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a struggle. We are in, we are in the middle of a major revolution. Um, and uh, this is, you know, I, you know, every, every, in, I mean, the government complains about every industry, you know, innovating too quickly and, and you know, for them to, you know, keep up with how to modernize the regulations, the regulatory frameworks. But this one is like, if those, if the average industry is going 50 miles an hour, okay, 
in innovate, you know, innovative change, evolution. Okay. Just on average, every mm-hmm. industry, mm-hmm. this industry is going a hundred miles an hour. Wow. Yeah. I think we are really on the precipice of a, you know, uh, titanic shift in the way we do commerce and the way countries interact with each uh, other in a yep. business sense. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, I, I know that I really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm going to need to take all the time to process <laughs> all the things you, you, you said, because not only are they important theoretically, but like you said, you know, we're moving 100 miles an hour. So we're, we're going to see the real world implementations of this a lot sooner than we normally would. If the payment industry had not made the, in, the investments in the technology, making it possible for e-commerce and electronic payments to, uh, and digital, you know, digital payments to happen online. Okay. Versus, you know, you go to the store, you swipe your card, you plug your card in right, right. at the store, you get your stuff and you leave. Okay. Versus go to Amazon and have your groceries delivered. Those are two different infrastructures. And if, 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 if we had not, our industry had not made that investment seven years ago, it was really, it's that it's not that long ago mm-hmm. in making it possible for people to do, to live their lives, live their e-commerce lives online around the world, right? We would be living in a much darker economy today. All right. Much darker. And if you, it's literally almost a year ago today where the entire planet shifted within days from buying everything in a physical location to buying almost everything online. Mm -hmm. and the capacity was there the systems were there in the 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 monster transition across the world right right was instantaneous seamless and almost flawless and and this is the crescendo so pay attention okay right it is it a lot of the thought leadership to make that happen seven years ago, eight years ago, okay, emanated from Atlanta. So in effect, you could say Atlanta helped save the world. Atlanta helped stabilize, Atlanta thought leadership helped stabilize the global economy during the pandemic. I, I, I don't want to say anything else. I don't want to ruin that. I can't, that was a yes, 100%. Thank you, West, so much for joining us. We are going to leave on that note. Thank you so much for your time.